Give me some, share some examples, the Old Testament or New Testament of um, some typologies, some types. What would be some examples of that? The sacrifices in the Old Testament. Right? Like, for instance, Passover, we just had Easter, so that's a great, that's all a type of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Even more. Sacrificial lamb. Yeah? Sacrificial lamb. The scapegoat also. The scapegoat, yeah. And those are beautiful. I love those pictures. Well, tonight's no different. You see at the top of your sheet there that it's the ancient Hebrew wedding tradition. And how that's a typology is because there are blatant bold three or four times uh, in the New Testament where you'll read, um, the kingdom of heaven is like unto, and the Lord goes into wedding tradition examples concerning the end times. So it's neat, but, but the thing of it is is that um, we in the West, we tend to we lose a little bit of, of well, a little bit of the translation because they do things really different, you know, in, in Israel, and uh, so what the customs are. A lot of them are similar, but then a lot of them are not. Uh, we have the parable of the ten virgins, and sometimes that is kind of lost on us, but. What I thought I would do, there's no way in our time frame we could actually spend two hours easily on getting into this, all the, the whole tradition and everything in there. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a real quick overview of what the, the, the tradition does, and then we're going to go over some scriptures. And then if I'm going too fast or I'm, gonna, I'm not clear on something, shoot your hand up and stop me. Because sometimes I have a tendency to do that, you know. Hillary sometimes accuses me of opening the fire hose, you know, and sometimes I'll tend to do that, and so I apologize in advance. But the way that the way it worked was, um, you know, you'll have a you'll have a, a young guy, a young gal, and the young guy might see a, a girl in the village that catches his eye. They did do kind of arranged marriages, but not like they do in Asia or in other cultures. But he might see a gal that kind of catches his eye. What he has to do then is he's got to go to the pops and say, Dad, there's this, this girl over here. You know. So he, he does some checking on her or whatever. You know, he's interested. So he starts to make the arrangement. He goes and talks to her dad. Now, in reality, they probably know each other. They probably visited in the village square, you know, shopping or whatever. So they probably know each other. They've probably flirted a little bit and talked a little bit. So it's not like completely arranged where they're strangers and don't know each other. That didn't happen real often, but there are times when it did. But um, more often than not, they knew each other. So his dad would go talk to her dad and kind of make an arrangement. And they'd talk about... Um, making a contract. So they kind of come up with this agreement and the son would be involved and then the daughter would be involved. And that would all be part of the patrol. And there's different names for different aspects of it. But what would happen was then um, after they make this agreement, they would actually sign a document, a covenant. So it'd be you know, a new covenant, a new contract. And they would drink on it. They'd drink a little wine. At that point, they're officially married, although it's not consummated yet. But they're considered married. And in fact, to get out of that contract, you'd have to have a divorce. And then the divorce is like an annulment of the contract as if it never happened, kind of a thing. Um, one way that would do that would be is if there was an adultery where somebody didn't wait or something like that, then whew, all beds are off, divorce before it's even consummated anyway. So that can happen. Um, but anyway, they, they would get together, and then what would happen is, is at that point, is that the young man would leave a, a gift of some kind, like we do with gate rings, right? 
Very often it might even be a really practical gift that the young man might leave or promise that he's going to be back. Now he disappears for roughly a year and he's going back to his dad's house. Now what happens here is, of course in the West, you know, it depends on how much money's involved, but the guy and the gal, hopefully they're not moving in with one of the parents in the basement. But sometimes we'll go live in an apartment or whatever. They'll go find an apartment, hiding or whatever like that. And so they get married and they go move into an apartment or house. And, and, and uh, the Hebrew culture, that's not the way it happened. What happened was is, is the bridegroom would go back to his father's house. And it'd be for roughly a year. He'd do a room addition. And that's the way they did it. It's, it's like a, the homestead. It's the family estate. And he'd go and add on. As he does his add-on, he, you know, whatever he's got to do, cabinets, whatever. Um, she, meanwhile, is, is preparing herself. She's getting her trousseau ready and all that good stuff. She's putting together her wedding party. Her bridesmaids, or as they, we know from the New Testament and the Gospels, it's the virgins. So they're putting the wedding party together. They're making plans, okay? So meanwhile, the parents are also making plans for this big feast that's going to happen. So that's about a year out. So now flash forward about roughly a year later, she's really waiting. She's got the white dress and she's got it sitting out. In fact, probably staying on her estate, on her property somewhere are the bridesmaids, the virgins, and they're watching. And they've got oil in their laps because sometimes it was a fun thing they would do is make a, a surprise visit at about midnight. Because where's the fun in showing up in the middle of the daytime? You know, it's better if you can make a lot of noise and wake people up. So she's waiting. He thinks he's ready. But he doesn't know yet. He's got to get dad's permission because he's doing the room addition to his dad's house. So he comes in and says, Dad, come take a look. I think I'm done. And he might come in and he'll come in with maybe a couple suggestions. You know, I, I think you need more cabinets in here, son. Trust me. <laughs> Guys, never design the women's kitchen exactly the way a woman wants us. He said, trust me, you're going to need some more cabinets. So anyway, he makes whatever, a couple little suggestions. The bridegroom makes some changes. And then when he's done, the you know, father will look around and say, it looks good. And he says, go take your bride. So that, at that point, uh, you know, after the patrol, you've got the separation, then you've got the procession, and this is, it starts off with the taking. And we'll get into more details on this, and you can fill in some notes, and I'll give you some scripture in here. I'm just giving you an overview first before we get into some of the scriptural examples. So, the bridegroom leaves. He's got his wedding party together. He's got his best men and all the other guys. And some of them have horns. They might have drums, things to bang on. And they're on their way now with a, a, a big parade. It's a big procession. And they're marching through the streets. People are peeking out their doors. What's going on? Oh, another, another wedding. And they're making noise, and as they get closer to the, the bride's house, they're making lots of noise. There's shouting going on, there's blowing horns, and it, it alerts her. She gets up, she's, oh my goodness, she's you know, getting her dress, getting everything ready, you know, grabbing her bags. The, the um, bridesmaids are outside, <coughs> the virgins, they're lighting their lamps. And then the, what happens is, is her family gets up, her wedding party gets, gets together, and the bridegroom never really makes it all the way to her house. They meet part way, like roughly maybe at the gate. She's coming out the gate, and then they merge. And then the wedding parties, they go back together. Now when they get to the father's house, celebration's already kind of underway. The guests are there. There are guests there, family and friends, and you know it's in full swing. She, meanwhile, is veiled. She's hidden. And um, she, she remains hidden for the entire time of celebration until the very end. Uh, and when she comes in, they have the, uh, a more official ceremony. Um, they go in, the, the wedding's consummated, and, but she still remains hidden. They come out, and there's all this feasting that happens, and the celebration goes on for a whole week. It's a one-week celebration. And then finally, when you get toward the end of the week, what happens is, is that this celebration then moves and becomes a bigger, uh, and you'll have um, a bigger um, supper, a bigger celebration, a wedding supper, a marriage supper. She is officially unveiled. Behold the bride, the wife, 
Everybody knows who she is anyway, probably. But anyway, it's the official unveiling. Finally, it's the big public spectacle. And, and that closes off the whole, whole celebration. So you can see that's some similarities to what we do in some cases, in some cases there's not. They'll also have like when the celebration, you'll see back then it was on each other's shoulders and things like that. Nowadays it's the chair dance. You know, you've probably seen that maybe in movies where she's in a chair and he's in a chair and they're holding them up in the air and they're dancing and stuff and they, and they meet together in the air. So you can see how some of this comes together and, and starts to sound really, really kind of familiar probably with what you've maybe read with some, some Bible passages. So with that, what I want to do is, um, any questions about that so far? It's kind of neat though, isn't it? Let's take a look at a, at a couple of these, and you can see how these are used in the scripture concerning the end. Um, you can look real quick to Matthew 25. Let's take a quick look. We can't, like I said, we can't hit all of them. I wish we could, but we can. Um, the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five of them that were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in the vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they slumbered and slept. So even the, even the wise ones who had oil fell asleep. But at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out and meet him. Then all those virgins arose, trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, this there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready, went in with them into the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered them, Sir, assuredly, I say to you, I don't know you. Watch therefore for you, neither know the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So there's a few things in there that we notice, right? Um, one of them is, is it, the, the thing with parables is, is that you take away from it what's um, mostly on the surface because like all examples that you give symbolism it breaks down after a while this isn't promoting that you can go to the store and buy salvation <laughs> you know but the oil is symbolic of the holy spirit but what the thing of it is is, is being ready and, and and the oil is understood as the holy spirit but clearly a lot of people who who think they're saved are going to find that they don't have oil and the rapture is going to happen right and they're going to go lord what i'm still here what is going on here? And that, that's going to be a call to repentance, right? Um, so there's a, list, a lesson in that that Jesus wants for us to learn. Um, attending a wedding feast will be not only the church as the bride of Christ, but others as well. The others will include uh, Old Testament saints um, who are going to be raised up as the second coming. <clears throat> Or at the second coming, but but they'll be, you know, their souls are there. They're with the Lord, right? Absent from the bodies, present with the Lord. And also, the martyred dead during the tribulation. So guests will be popping in here <laughs> along the way. Oh, you made it! Great. Um, as the angel told John to write in Revelation 19:9, "Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage." Um, supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb is a glorious celebration of all who are in Christ. So, here's here are a couple phrases that we use a lot that I, I want to show you how it's actually part of the marriage tradition. Um, in John 14. You can flip there. The whole chapter is really great. John 14, the first three verses. Famous passage. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. Does that sound familiar? If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. 
So he's drawing an analogy even there from the Jewish wedding. So, you know, it's an, it's an idiom for that. Now, when he says, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I gave you, that where, uh, that where I am, you may go also, you may be also. Take you is very specific. I mean, we just tend to read it and just say, well, I'm going to take you. But that part of the, the Jewish wedding tradition is the taking. That's one of the words, one of the phrases for it. It's the taking, and that's when at the procession, the father says to the son, go and take your bride, is that he goes like a thief, except her family, her dad, the brothers, they all kind of look away because they know, oh, it's, it's, the, it's the bridegroom. So it's kind of the game. It's kind of the fun and the tradition. So like a thief, the bridegroom comes and takes her. And that's the taking. So she comes out to meet him and whisk her away. So that's the rapture right there. Notice it's, it's not at all emblematic and, and can't be of the second coming because in the second coming, what happens? We come back with him, right? This is a situation where he comes, not all the way, but just part way, and they meet together part way and then go to the father's house. That need or what? Um, you can also look at, you can write down also part of that. Um, John 13, 36, where Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus said, where I'm going, you cannot follow me, but you will follow me afterward. I mean, that's really kind of part of that. That's like the bridegroom saying, I'm you know, going to the Father's house. You'll, you know, you'll follow afterwards. I want to touch on, because you know, everybody here should understand, but I want to make sure that, that um, it's really clear. We know from Ephesians 5 how the church is, is the bride of Christ, right? Um, I've been in some group situations and, and taught Bible study in a couple places where they didn't really get that concept. They didn't really understand that whole idea. So it's always good to reiterate it. But it's in Ephesians 5, if, and... Um, oh, in, in verses um, 30 and 32 of Ephesians 5, he's, we're members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man must leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So it's another one of those mysteries that Paul unraveled. For them. Um, down verse, well, up in verse 25, you know, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church uh, and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Even that little part, washing of water by the word, we're, we're baptized. There's a tradition in, in the wedding tra tradition that's called the mikvah, and there's a, a, a ceremonial washing that happens separately. The bride and the bridegroom. They go through the ceremonial washing. And just like the baptism that we enjoy now and that, that Jesus did. So all along, we find all along the way, Jesus is leaving breadcrumbs that are pointing to this type of language that has to do with our relationship with him. So it's a beautiful thing. Okay, so this patrol custom, it's called the ketubah. Let me see if I can spell that for you in case you're, you really want it, but I think I spelled that right. I mean, it's phonetic anyway, right? Because they use pictographs, but, but um, it was usual for a marriage covenant to be established as a result of the prospective bridegroom taking the initiative, as I described. Jesus made it possible for us to spend eternity with him. Um, what would happen is, is um, similar with us, is that we know that our relationship with the Lord, we know that, there's so many examples we could give in the scriptures about how the Father arranged the relationship with us and gave us his sheep to him. 
the same thing too as a bride. So the father is the one who established this relationship all along. And, and so that example is there. Um, the, the bridegroom traveling from the father's house. And let's see, let's give one right here real quick. John 6, 38, if you want to write it down, he says, Jesus says, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So Jesus left his father's house in, in heaven and he traveled to earth, the home of his prospective bride, the church, close to 2,000 years ago. So now he must get approval for, from the father of the bride, and the negotiations began over a dowry. <clears throat> so there's still kind of a dowry thing that happens. Um, also part of the betrothal custom. This is, this is beautiful. The bridegroom would negotiate, as I said, with the, with the father of the young woman to determine the price. It's the mohar. I guess I can write that one down too, but I do with my pen. It looks like it says mohair, but it's not. Okay, so that is the price that must be purchased for the bride. Now, what was the price that was made to purchase us? Blood. Yeah, it's the blood of Christ. His own life. Isn't that amazing? All the detail in here is just beautiful. Matthew 26, 39 says, he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So it's kind of the dowry. Like 1 Corinthians 11, um, in the same way he also took the cup after supper, saying, and um, it's verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 11, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So once the bridegroom paid the mohar, the purchase price, the marriage covenant is thereby established. It's set in stone. The young man and the woman are regarded as husband and wife. And when did, when did Jesus do this with us? When was, was, was that contract made, though? In eternity past? Well, it was. I mean, it, that's when the plan was made. The plan was made in eternity past, but he made the contract for all of this right before the cross. He established it with when they had the contract and they had the Last Supper and they drank the wine and all of that, and he shared the covenant of his blood, and then it was finally established in his death. So that all is part of the whole patrol of custom. And, you know, what greater love is there than that? We told him what he was going to do, and then he went out there and he did it. Um, so from the moment the price is paid for the bride, she's declared at that point to be consecrated or sanctified, set apart ex exclusively for her bridegroom. Even though he's away for a year, the marriage is not consummated, no dating. <laughs> you know? He belongs to her, or she belongs to him, and he belongs to her. So it's exclusive. Hebrews 10.10 is 10, a, a good one. It says, and by that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So it's the same language there. We, are, we have become sanctified in Christ once and for all through the offering of his body. That's also eternal security. It's, uh, it's the offering of the body of Christ that set us apart from once and for all. We're fully justified, washed in his blood. But the separation process continues, right, until we go to be with the Lord and we glorify him. But that's another message. Get off on that one. Okay, also part of the ritual of custom, as I said, is um, the symbol of the relationship that's been established is the groom and the bride would drink from the cup of wine <coughs> Over a betrothal benediction would be a prayer there. And it'd be <coughs> so again, a part of the benediction would be like Jesus said, this is the cup of, of the new covenant in my blood. In this case it was in his blood. But they, you know, he he drank a cup of covenant, so the wine is associated, or his blood is associated with the New Testament, 
with this contract. Um, we, we see that play out in, in Matthew 26, um, verses 26 through 29. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and we did when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Then comes, after that, now we're getting to, into the part where we've gone from the trouble, now we're getting into the separation custom. And, and what Jesus did that matches the Jewish wedding tradition uh, for the separation. So after the marriage covenant has been established, the groom would leave the home of the bride and return to his father's house. Um, Jesus even said that in John 20, right? He's, he said, you know, after, after the resurrection, uh, Mary's clinging to him. He says, don't cling to me. In uh, John 20, 17, he says, don't cling to me for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. So what he's announcing is, is he's going to prepare a place. So it's a separate accommodation, a separate place in these building accommodations. So what those accommodations are, now who's got a guess on what the accommodations are, the building on the room addition to the Father's house, what do you think that is? been setting it the last couple Wednesdays. Pastor, good picture of it. It's New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem is a room addition. That's what he's building. He's been working on it for a couple thousand years, so it should be impressive. Mm -hmm. It's roughly, in miles, it comes out to about 800 miles by 800 miles by 800 miles. That's like, that goes up way higher than the space station in space. Way higher. So it's impressive. So the bridegroom would remain separate from his bride for a period of about 12 months. And um, when Jesus left, he says, It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. In John 16 7. Remember, I said there's kind of a, in the separation, he leaves with a parting gift. Part, our part and gift, the Lord leaves with us. To, we're sealed in the Holy Spirit, right? The declaration's been made that now we belong to Him. It's official. Instead of putting an engagement ring on our, our finger, we're sealed in the Holy Spirit. Sign the Holy Spirit on our foreheads, right? And it also affords the bride time to gather her trousseau and to prepare for her married life. Um, Jesus said in Matthew 6, he says, Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Part of our sanctification of the Lord, right, is, is valuing the right things and how we separate our, our lives to him. And we're looking for uh, character value, things that make us more like Jesus Christ to improve our lives and not things where rust and moths corrupt. Now, part of the procession custom now, procession is at the end of the period of separation, the groom would go to take his bride to live with him. He says, um, in John 14, 2, again, he says, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. So the groom comes for his bride at a time not known exactly to her. She lives in expectation until um, he surprises her with his return. And it usually took place at night. Jesus used that language sometimes too, right? About midnight. Um, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, he says, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Thief in the night is not an admonition to the church about being caught off guard. A lot of times this is used about, boy, you don't want to get caught off guard by the Lord when he comes because we're what's being stolen. We're what's valued. We're being stolen from the world, right? We're the salt and, and the light in the world for the Lord. 
So we're what's being stolen out of the world. So it's a warning to the world. So we're like a precious stone in that way. So the groom, the best man. Now who's the best man? You know that you all know this one, right? John 3, 29, Luke 16, 16, and Matthew 11, 11 to 13 in your procession custom, those past. The friend of the bridegroom is John the Baptist. So he's the best man. So he and all his friends, they're all in this big procession, and they all meet us. Meet the, we meet the Lord in the air, but apparently he's going to have some guests with him when we meet him in the air when we're raptured. It's going to be a big homecoming. Hey! So it'll be awesome. For the Son of Man will come in his glory, and in the glory of his Father with the angels, Matthew 16, 27. Y'all still with me? Am I losing anybody or what? It's, it's kind of doing, it's different, but it's beautiful, right? I mean, it's, it's such a blessing. It's moving. Okay, so part of the procession custom still, we're in that whole thing. So they, they go and get together. Although the bride was expecting her groom to come for her, she didn't know the exact time of his coming. Mark 13, 32, this verse people get, we throw it around, we use it, kind of carelessly not really knowing what it means, but it's got a, the meaning is a double entendre. It means two different things. So let me share with you real quick what it is. Am I doing on time? I'm doing okay. Um, of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only knows. That verse now finally makes sense. So this is why, why did the Son know when he's coming? Well, he's using verbiage that would trigger for the apostles, for the disciples, what he was talking about. Notice none of them said, Lord, what do you mean by that? Because they knew what the language meant. It's like, oh, it's like the marriage. Oh, okay, so you're going away and the Father knows. So you're waiting for permission from him. But also we know when he came the first time, when Jesus came, he came in humility, right? He left all his wealth, riches behind. He did everything by permission, his first coming while he was here. So a lot of times he didn't go asking or beseeching or demanding any special knowledge or anything, everything that came to him is as the Lord, as the Father, directly revealed him as he needed it or, you know, as he was to bestow it upon us or whatever. So even here, I believe he was also sincere when he says, I don't know, because the Father hadn't revealed it to him yet either at this point. Now, of course, by the time the resurrection happens and he's glorified, oh, he knows, you know, by that point because... He's fully restored and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. But first time he came, he came in humility and he gave a lot up while he was down here. So I believe it was sincere that at that time he didn't know, but but um, the Father only. But he was using the, the marriage in there. But the thing about the day and the hour no one knows also is an idiom for um, a time of the year. What are the feasts? The, the Feast of Trumpets? Um, it's called, the Feast of Trumpets is weird because most of the, the Lord's feast days, as you, as you remember probably reading from, like for instance, Leviticus 23, they're all on new moons, right? Just like we just had Passover, it's a new moon. We can tell it's full. There it is, it's full. Or it's not quite, it's maybe tomorrow. But a new moon is unique in that what we think of as a new, new moon or, or what NASA would have is it's fully black, right? Nothing. You can't see nothing. But a new moon in the Hebrew custom was a little sliver of light. Now that's a problem when you get toward fall because what would happen is, is um, you, you've got this, I keep setting this down, and forget where it's, you got the horizon here and you've got, the sun is going down so it's bright glare and then at the same time for a little brief period you might have a little sliver of moon peek up above the horizon. And that's a new moon. It's, it's not when it's fully black, but when just the first little sliver shows up. And then it's, it's no sooner up than it's back down over the hill. So what it is, is it's, it's the long day. And they'll, even today, they'll still celebrate what they call Rosh Hashanah, but it's the Feast of Trumpets. They'll celebrate it over two days. Because if they miss it one day, they'll get it the second. That's why it's the feast that no man knows. No man knows the day or the hour. Because they sent two witnesses. Does that sound familiar? They sent two witnesses up on a hill 
to watch for the new moon. And they might miss it because the sun's too bright. They go, ah, well, it'll be tomorrow. And when they do that, they go down the hill. They have the, the priest certify that, yes, there was a signing over Jerusalem and all that kind of stuff. And they blow the horns and, and all that. But um, So that's a double entendre there. So a lot of people think that because of some of these double entendres too, Jesus fulfilled the spring feasts, all of them, to the day in his life, first coming. And that we get a lot of that in, in 1 Corinthians 15, for example. And Pentecost is when the church was established and we all got the Holy Spirit. Now we've got the fall feasts, and the fall feasts have not been fulfilled yet. And a lot of theologians say, well, it's no accident that it's the Feast of Trumpets. And uh, what happens is there's... Um, you know, a trumpet blast, it's, it's the, the day that no man knows, the day or the hour, but you know the season. <clears throat> so you kind of know the season, but you don't know exactly when. And a lot of people believe that, well, Jesus is probably going to return, since he did everything else exactly the day, that he might return on Yom Teruel, or Feast of Trumpets, some year. We just don't know when. And well, it's, he mentioned before about midnight. Will it be at midnight? Will it be midnight, about midnight over Jerusalem? I mean, I don't, we don't know. We know generally that's that's why, you know, it's the doctrine of eminence. The rapture is the is the next big thing to happen. Is really what eminence is, not that it's going to happen any minute, but really nowadays it will. But it's the next big event that doesn't require any preview things to set it up. It's just it's the next big event that's going to happen that we can stick a pin in and say it's going to happen. So this no man knows the dare they are. Uh, not the Son, the Father only. It's, it's a double entendre for that kind of that kind of language. So a lot of people will, will tie it together, whether that's accurate or not, and a fair thing to do or not. I'm not. I'm not sure. I I like the idea, especially if it's sooner rather than later. Uh, okay, we're getting there. So, okay, so the groom's arrival would be preceded by a shout that forewarned the bride. And that's, you know, really, that's 1 Thessalonians 4, right? For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. Also, and with the trumpet of God. Same verse. The groom's arrival will be received by a shout that forewarned the bride to be prepared for the coming of the groom. Now, the trumpet, about that trumpet... We understand Jesus is supposed to come, you heard about the last trump, right? At the last trump. It's interesting, and this is a Feast of Trumpets thing too, and I'll throw this in as a bonus since we've got time, we'll, we'll be fine. Is that um, there's a hundred different trumpet blasts during this two-day period of Yom Teruah, Feast of Trumpets. They do things a little different, modern Rosh Hashanah, they do things a little different nowadays. You know, they modernize things, kind of like Christmas has become Lord knows what compared to what the original Christmas was, right? But... Um, there's a, a hundred different trumpet blasts that you've probably heard. If you've ever gone online and looked at the um, coddled cam, you can look it up. It's interesting to do sometimes. It's spelled like this. You can, you can Google it. But if you look up, it, it's a camera at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. And it's kind of cool during the, some of the celebrations to watch it because they're dancing around and they're... They're praising old Hebrew songs. They're singing the knees and all. And they're singing and they're praying. And they're crying out to the Lord. One of these days, that's going to be a cry of repentance. But they're looking for the Messiah. So it's a blessing to see. It's sad that they missed him the first time around. But they're praying. They're looking for the Lord. And so it's, it's kind of interesting. So the Kabbalah can. It's interesting to watch during some of these celebrations. But the very last blast, the last trump itself, is the Tekia Gedola. And it's the last, it's, it's a ram's horn, and it's a blast. It's the last trump, the hundredth one, blasted for as long as that dude can hold it.
you know, it be over a minute long, and it's just this one long, spine-chilling, really kind of a cool blast of a ram's horn. So, but when Jesus said he's coming at the last trump, that's another reason, too. You see this here with the trumpet sound and everything, and the last trump is the actual term used in the Feast of Trumpets. So is it a coincidence? I don't believe in coincidences. I believe we can misunderstand some things, and it might be a misunderstanding, but to me it would be kind of cool if it did all come together that way. Um, so the groom receives his bride together with her female attendants. The enlarged wedding party will return to the uh, bride's return from the bride's home to the groom's father's house. Um, first, and that's still the same passage. First Thessalonians four sixteen it says, "We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air." That's where, we, where the rapture comes from. It's caught up, is the taking. Harpazo in the Greek. And it's the taking. So the bridegroom makes it as far as the gate, but doesn't get all the way there. That's why critics will say, well, there's not two second comings. Well, there, there kind of is, but it's not a returning all the way. It's not like he sets his foot down on the Mount of Olives and splits and all of this. Okay, so th this is another important part. This is a part two because you've got pre-wrath, mid-trib, post-trib, but part of the wedding procession, the custom is upon arriving at the father's house, the wedding party would find that the wedding guests and guests are assembled already. Um, John 10, 16, Jesus says, other sheep I have which are not of this fold, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Um, he gave them lots of hints a lot of times that it wasn't going to be just about just Jews, right? He's letting them know that so there's a bunch of people that are waiting, and the celebration would go on for a full week. That's just part of the Hebrew trust, um, custom with the, with the consummation, the big festival that's going on, the wedding celebration. It's a whole week long. And about that, too, and, and, and missing the, the whole tribulation. You know, during the seven-year tribulation, she's, the bride is hidden hidden away, hidden from, hidden from the world, just as we would be. Um, in, in Revelation 3, uh, about the Church of Philadelphia, I, I love this verse here because it describes what the Lord's going to do. And I always thought, too, he said, why would, if this is a time of wrath upon the world, why would the bridegroom pour wrath on his bride? <laughs> you know, or before the body of Christ also, or he pour a wrath on his own body. You know, so the plan is to take us out of the way. So verse 7 of Revelation 3, and to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, this is the faithful church, right? The words of the Holy One, the True One, one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens. Verse 8, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet have kept my word and have not denied my name. Here's the key verse, verse 10. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that's coming on part of the world, the whole world. The part of the world where you don't live? No, it's the whole world. To try who? Those who are dwelling on the earth. So not only are we kept out of the whole world, but those who are dwelling on the world, those, and it's not some, it's everybody who's dwelling on the earth. So that's a key verse. He says, I'm coming soon, verse 11, hold fast to that which you have, so that uh, no one might seize your crown. The one who conquers, I'll make him a pillar in, my, uh, of my, um, in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. There it is, right there. That's where we're going to verify that new Jerusalem is it, our new home, which comes down from God, from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So that's to verify that new Jerusalem is it. It's it's the church, uh, our home. It, when you read Revelation 21, when it's announced, New Jerusalem, he says, hey, John, come up here. I'm going to show you something. 21, 
21. Revelation 19 and, and, and Revelation 21 are, are key passages about that, the wedding supper and New Jerusalem. He says, um, Behold the bride, the wife. And he makes the announcement, and it's coming down out of heaven. So it's very common for the home to be identified with who lives there. <clears throat> when the Jews in the Old Testament frequently when they prayed, they prayed to heaven. What does that mean when they're not praying to, praying to a place? It's a place where God dwells, so it's identified with God because it's where he dwells. The same thing with New Jerusalem, is it's the bride. Identified as the bride because it's where we dwell. It's our new home. So, so they have, the, and nowadays it's lifted up on chairs, but they, but they, um, they meet together in the air, that celebration they do. Uh, First Thessalonians 4, 16 again said, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together, meet, meet them in, um, meet the Lord in the air just the same way as the chair dance um, and then they, the part of the consummation is in the privacy of the bridal chamber they would enter the physical union for the first time thereby consummating the marriage and for us what that means is spiritually um, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12 for now we see in a mirror dimly but then face to face now I know in part then I shall know fully even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. So meanwhile, the seven years of tribulation take place on earth, and we're getting to know our Lord intimately, finally, because now we see through a glass darkly. That might be about all I want to get into and take time for. Like I said, we could, this is just a, like the Reader's Digest condensed version. Um, but again, read Revelation 21, 21-2. Uh, Let's turn it real quick, just, just for glance. We'll finish up with this. <coughs> Y'all have been very patient, I know it's Let's see, let's look at verse 2 real quick. It says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And then um, down in verse 9, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues, he came to me and, and talked with me, saying, Come, I'll show you the bride, the lamb's wife. So he carried me away in verse 10 in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, etc., etc. Awesome, isn't it? And then don't forget, too, the very last thing is the very supper of the Lamb. Your, your verses for that are, are Revelation 19, 6 to 10. Um, I personally, there's, there's some disagreement about this, but I personally believe that the marriage supper of the Lamb does take place on earth. And part of the reason why is because um, the passage doesn't say it excludes any of the saints, but it's a, it's a marriage supper that all the saints are invited to. Yet, at the end of the tribulation, you're going to have mortals, right, who are believers. You have the separation of the sheep and goats and all this, but there's going to be a bunch of people who are like you and I who are mortals, that we're not ready for heaven and, um, you know, we're still flesh and blood, and we're not really set up for that lifestyle up there or anything. We, they will still live down here on the earth, but yet, the marriage supper is supposed to include all the saints. So, we know that the first resurrection, the Old Testament saints, they're going to be, get their bodies too at the same time. They're resurrected, Right? So even they're going to get to enjoy the meal as well. All the Old Testament saints, they're the wedding guests, and they all come in together. So that's why I believe, because Jesus is coming down out of heaven, we can return with him, and he's doing this big mop-up process. In, in Revelation 19, you got verses 6 to 10, of, it's kind of the announcement. They're praising in heaven, saying, oh, this is it, folks. This is going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. Woo this is what we've all been waiting for. Then verse 11, 16 is the arrival of the bridegroom. He's coming on a white horse. 
Then verses 17 to 21 is, is kind of the angelic mop-up, you know, they, from the four corners of the earth and the grapes of wrath and all that stuff. There's a big mop-up process. And then, and then what happens is chapter 20 kind of goes into trying to answer the question a little bit. I, I believe it's parenthetic, answering the natural questions we would have about, well, wait, wait, what happens to the false prophet, the beast? Are they going to be, what about Satan? What about the bad guys who are going to be there? What happens to them? Well, this is what happens to them, the separation of the sheep and goats and <clears throat> Satan's bound for a thousand years, etc. cetera. The beast and false prophet are thrown in the pit. And then he describes what happens you know, to the saints. And then he goes into verse 21 and he resumes the narrative. Or not verse 21, chapter 21. That's the best way I understand it, but I'm sure we'll get into that more with, with Pastor Greg, and we've, we've had some lengthy discussions about it. It's a lot of fun. It's a blessing. It's a blessing watching for the Lord and seeing the, the plans laid out that he went, all the trouble. Imagine this, all this trouble for us, and he's gone through, and he's including us in these plans, and to me, that's just beautiful that he goes through all that for us. Because, you know, what have we done, you know, we're... Creatures he made out of the dirt, and we sinned, and we blew it, and we cursed, we left, and we turned our backs on him, and yet he reached out to us. So it's... <laughs> All right, let's close real quick in prayer, and then if you have any more questions or, or anything, we can do that, and then that way we can dismiss and whoever needs to go can go. Lord, thank you so much for what you show us in your word. Um, sometimes it's kind of a puzzle pulling it together, it seems like, but... Um, and more we understand your word and what you've done in the past and how we pull it together and understand it for us way up here 2,000 years after the time of Christ. It's, it's amazing, Lord, when we can pull some of these together and be blessed by what you've done. Lord, all the work that you've gone through for your glory and also on our behalf, that you would include us in that. Again, Lord, who are we that you're even mindful of us? Let alone want to be in a, a betrothal marriage with us. Thank you for that, though, Lord. Bless us throughout this week. Help us to seek your face daily. And uh, every, all things that we do, that we might glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.